Well, hello, everybody. Pastor Joel here with you one more time for the past days with Pastor Joel. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you happen to be watching this. Thanks for tuning in. And just as a reminder, if you haven't subscribed yet, why in the world not? Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, we want to get the message of a fulfilled understanding of the scripture as close as across the street and as far out as across the world, because it's so important to realize who Jesus really is. And did he, in fact, accomplish the things that he said he would? And I believe that he did exactly when and as he said he would. And so we are continuing in our series on Genesis, looking at the creation account, chapter one through about chapter two, verse four. And then we're going to be heading into chapter three, which, of course, we get into the the fall. Um, I'm entitled entitling that video, The Fall of All, and that's coming up. And of course, so many incredible things just within the first few chapters of of Genesis that a lot of uh, what I call Bible people sometimes, commentators, theologians, pastors, teachers, what have you, a lot of them will say that um, those first few chapters of Genesis are really the foundations, the moorings of our whole theological understanding of the scriptures. And I think I would concur with that. So really important things we're getting into. And if you can, I would encourage you to join me throughout this entire study as it's going to build, build, and build precept upon precept. And it's just a marvelous the way the Spirit of God superintends the scriptures and puts it all together. This series is called God's Story. And just by way of reminder, it's the overarching story of scripture and then all of the really important stories of redemption within that larger story. That is the main point. And so far, we have looked at three different ways of interpreting the first and part of the second chapter of Genesis, the creation story. Let me go ahead and share my screen with you so you can see those. Uh, So we have what's referred to, and sometimes you'll see these abbreviations, YEC, Young Earth Creationism. That would be the literal uh, six 24-hour Days. Um, most people who hold to that would say the Earth is somewhere between six and eight thousand years old. Some might bump it up to ten thousand or so, depending on how the genealogies work. Where some would believe there are some gaps there, which may extend that time a little bit. Um, then we have what's often abbreviated OEC, Old Earth Creationism. By the way, I would encourage you to go back and watch the past couple videos because I list some of the main proponents of those views and suggest some resources that might be helpful for you. And then we have um, what I'm calling meaningful earth creationism. I, what I called it before was a little more clunky, but as far as I know, there's not necessarily a specific title for this, but meaningful earth creationism might be one way of looking at it where meaning is more important than material and where function is more important than formation. And so this This view definitely has some relationships with the final view that I'm going to introduce anyway. I'm not saying there aren't more, but I'm going to be introducing a view in just a minute here that is related to this meaningful earth creationism. Um, In this sense, both the meaningful earth creationism and the view I'm going to present posit that what's important in those first couple chapters is not how God created the physical universe. They're not denying that he did it, but they're saying what's more important than how he did things is why he did things, that he was preparing a place for humanity. And again, that that view says meaning is more important than material and function is more important than formation. We also looked at all the temple themes that we see in creation, and we're going to come back to some of those temple things themes as we get to Exodus, where Moses has given instructions to make the tabernacle, the portable temple, and then leading into Solomon's physical temple, because it is really fascinating to see those those connections there. Um, I already had one person watch that video, which I just dropped a little earlier today, and said that they were just fascinated by that content. And, and it is, no, no question. And it's hard to deny that those themes are there. Okay, but there's yet another option, and it is... Covenant creation, abbreviated as CC. Now, this is a little bit newer to me. It's probably newer to you. And so because it's a little newer to me and I'm still studying a lot of it out, I'm just going to read some some quotes from from a book that talks about this view that, as far as I know, is probably the most well-known book that posits 
these ideas. And that way I'm not you know, making stuff up as I'm still studying and learning, but you're hearing it right from the horse's mouths, so to speak. Uh, the book is called Beyond Creation Science. I have read the whole book and am, am now in the process of going through a little bit of it again. Um, I just learned that it is available free um, online in PDF form. And of course, I'm sure the authors would appreciate it if you purchase a copy or two as well, but you can find it on free online. So if you went to Beyond Creation Science PDF, Beyond Creation Science free copy, something like that, um, you'll probably be able to find it that way. And then what I've done is given some quotes and then given the, the page numbers here as we go through it. Um, now, before we come back to that, I just don't want you to read ahead because, you know, you're the smartest audience in the world and you might be overachievers and want to read ahead. And I need you to listen to me. I'm just teasing. But um, I just want to give the, the general idea of this because this particular view, covenant creation, is really directly tied to the fulfilled view of biblical prophecy, a.k.a. preterism. Again, preterism uh, from the Latin praetur just means past. And so preterists believe that uh, prophecies that many people would think are yet to happen in the future have already happened in the past. The so-called partial preterist view would say that, that many, most, some would even sort of say all prophecies have already been fulfilled, but yet there is still this uh, coming future, you know, bodies coming out of the graves, a future Christ visibly returning on the clouds, a future final judgment, and a future some type of catastrophic event to the planet and or the cosmos. Now, those that are more in the Reformed camp would think of that more as like a remodeling project, and those in the more dispensational or evangelical camp that are not Reformed would think of a complete destruction of the planet and cosmos and then something completely brand new. But partial preterists, regardless of how much uh, they, how many prophecies they believe are yet fulfilled, they still see a future fulfillment, which is sometimes called a dual fulfillment. Whereas the full preterist view, and that's just full disclosure, that's the one that I hold to, says all prophecy has been fulfilled and there's nothing in the scriptures that, that do teach a, a sort of a future dual fulfillment of these events. And if that's the first time uh, you've heard that, please don't you know, go to another channel, but uh, but keep listening as we go through these scriptures to, and be a good Berean, Acts 17, 11, to see what they say. Well, covenant creation, again, is directly related to a fulfilled view of prophecy because, and, I, and I'm going to explain this in a general sense, and then we'll go to these quotes. But the, the claim of these authors, a J.L. Vaughn and Tim Martin co-authored this book, Beyond Creation Science, and then I know other people who hold of this view as well. And the claim goes something like this. From a futurist perspective, we would believe that there's a connection between the opening chapters of Genesis and the closing chapters of Revelation. And again, I think all Christians would believe this in some sense, that whatever was happening at the beginning and this Garden of Eden, which oftentimes people will say is perfect, those scriptures don't, interestingly, the term perfect is not used there. The first five days, God said it was good. The sixth day, he said it was very good. Nowhere in there that I've found does it say it was perfect. But at any rate, all believers would see a connection between whatever was happening there. That's that's where we're going to get back to um, in Revelation. Um, and they see, would see uh, Genesis 1 and 2 as the, the first heavens and earth, um, or the creation of the heavens and earth is probably a better way to say it. And then the last couple chapters of Revelation, uh, the creation of a new heavens and earth. So there's this there's this connection there that I think all Christians would see. Well, what some have said from the from the preterist perspective is that well, wait a minute. If if the scriptures in fact do not teach an end of the material physical planet, then can we be sure that Genesis is speaking of the creation of a real physical planet? In other words, if there's a connection there. And Revelation is using apocalyptic language uh, to talk about the, the end, actually, of the Old Covenant or the, the Judaic system and the temple and so on. Then could it be that if there really is a connection to be consistent, then does Genesis, when it talks about the creation of heavens and earth, is that also covenantal language? And so just logically, um, I think we can follow that line of thought. Um, in other words, whatever 
whatever the heavens and earth were at the beginning, they ought to be the same at the end, oughtn't they? That is the idea. And so with that in mind, let's just go from some quotes from the book. And, and um, there's obviously tons here that I didn't cover, but I looked at the section of the book that, that sort of introduces this idea of covenant creation. And so these first couple paragraphs are from page 261. Christian theologians have y'all long having trouble speaking today. Have you noticed? Christian theologians have long recognized a connection between Genesis and Revelation. Author Craig Hill explains the relationship this way. Although eschatology is technically about the end, most eschatologies are heavily dependent on a doctrine of creation. The end will be as the beginning. In chapters 11 and 12, again, they're saying in their book, we highlighted the theological connection between the beginning and the end in relation to the fall of Adam and redemption of Christ. Just as the fall of Adam relates to the moral world of man's covenant relationship to God, so the redemption of Christ restores that broken relationship for all those in Christ who is the last Adam. The curse placed on Adam in Genesis is removed in Revelation for all those who are in Christ, those who dwell in the holy city and have access to the tree of life. Again, what they've said so far, I think all believers are going to concur, uh, essentially, that, that Jesus came to fix what Adam broke. And in, in a couple videos, we're going to get into what was the death of Adam is so, so important. So look for that. Jesus, through his finished work of salvation, defeated the death brought into the world by Adam. Covenant, Genesis to Revelation. We believe it would be a mistake to limit the relationship between Genesis and Revelation to redemptive theology. There is a wider link, say Vaughn and Martin, between the opening and closing books of the Bible. Milton Terry, the noted authority on biblical hermeneutics, points out the significance and relationship of these two biblical books. It is a most remarkable revelation, he said, to stand at the beginning of the Holy Scriptures, and it is well for us at this early stage of our apocalyptic studies to point out the fact, listen to what Terry says here, that the last prophetic book of the canon makes conspicuous use of the symbols and suggestions of the first three chapters of Genesis and seems divinely adapted to stand as its final counterpart. What Genesis does, Revelation undoes. The story begun in Genesis concludes in Revelation. This relationship has inevitable consequences for the right understanding of the opening chapters of Genesis. Again, that's from 261 of Beyond Creation Science. And, and what do we see? We see the beginning, the, the garden themes. What do we see in Revelation? The garden themes. We see the serpent in Genesis. We see the serpent. Um, in Revelation, we see creation of heavens and earth in Genesis. We see uh, bringing in the new heavens and earth in Revelation. That's what Terry's saying. By the way, uh, Milton Terry is certainly still um, noted as, as one of the, the very best at hermeneutics. And he has a book simply titled Biblical Hermeneutics that I would highly recommend. Um, it's not something you're probably going to you know, pick up your last few minutes before going to bed and do devotional reading through. Um, but it's, it's well worth it. And then just recently, I think this was published through American Vision, which is kind of uh, Gary DeMar's ministry there. But they they put out a uh, the Apocalypse of John, I think is what it's called by Milton Terry. And I have that as well and have really been enjoying it so far. So you might look at that. So they go on on page 262. They say, we suggest the central focus of Genesis creation is the same as the central focus of biblical prophecy. God's covenant relationship with man, thus covenant creation. There may be physical events referenced in the creation account, just as Revelation references physical events in the first century. But the main subject of the opening chapters of Genesis is not a historical record of the formation of the physical universe. Again, that's where we would see this in, in common with the more functional view of creation. The main subject is God's covenant relationship to all things. We believe the opening chapters are primarily a covenant statement, not a scientific account of the origin of the physical universe. And then they go on and to go further into their presentation. You with me? Let's jump now to pages 255 and 266. They say the scientific focus of literalism explains why, and this is important, both young earth creationism and popular forms of old earth creationism embrace global futurism. Futurism disconnects biblical prophecy from its Christ-centered, redemptive-focused context. Futurism reads biblical prophecy in 
um, sorry, that, that's just a note there. In culture and global fears, they are planetary concerns. This is important. Those who begin with a scientific literalism in Genesis logically expect, logically expect revelation to give a scientific record of events related to the end of planet Earth and the physical universe. Let me read that again. Those who begin with scientific literalism in Genesis logically expect revelation to give a scientific literal record of events related to the end of planet Earth and the physical universe. And again, believers are going to agree on this. Whatever is happening at Revelation seems to, to or Genesis rather, seems to end at Revelation. Whatever it is that Adam broke, Jesus came to fix. So there's consistency. Um, but if we start with a with a scientific, you know, physical material universe and make that the locus of our studies, that's how we're going to expect everything to end. They go on to say there's no question that the scientific literalists are consistent in how they handle the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Just what I said. The question is whether this is the right way to handle scripture. Terry sums up the best criticism of science-driven interpretations of typical views of Genesis creation. He says, we gain nothing for the honor of the scriptures by attempting to force upon them a meaning they were never intended to convey. The same warning applies to global futurist interpretations of prophecy. It's worth repeating that futurists tend to rip passages like Matthew 24 and texts in Revelation out of their biblical contexts and apply them directly to modern day scientific technologies and cultural contexts. The interpretive implications for scientific literalism are the same, whether we speak about Genesis or Revelation. Wrong conclusions, important, are inevitable regarding both ends of the Bible when the starting point is scientific literalism. So there is so much here, by the way, um, I, I could uh, recommend this book to you, Beyond Creation Science. Um, do I agree with all of it? No. Uh, no, I don't. And there are, again, some things I'm studying out. And, and one of the wonderful things about the world is it's okay if we agree with 60, 70, 80, 90 percent, or even 40 percent of what someone says. We can still love them and be their friends. Everyone sigh together. <sighs> I say that because it is so ridiculous how we have so many warring fractions in our cultures, whether it's politically or theologically or philosophically or whatever it is where, it, and I don't remember this like, like growing up, but like now it's like, if I don't agree with everything about you, I'm going to, you know, unfriend you. So there, ha, hang out my cell phone on you, which is way less effective than those old landline phones. But anyway, just, just crazy. So um, I can recommend that to you without, thinking that, that every part of it is glorious, and that's okay. So some important questions to ask. Uh, what type of literature is Genesis? How do we know? Again, the traditional way is to, to take our modern Western 21st century science and cram it and shove it back in there and push it in there in reverse. But how do we really know? We compare scripture with scripture. Now, Chilton, this would be David Chilton, notes the presence of prophecy in Genesis 15. He says the same is true of the prophets. They also spoke in figures and symbols. Hello, trees, talking snakes, etc., drawing on a rich heritage of biblical images that began in the Garden of Eden. Indeed, paradise is where prophecy began. It's worth noting the very first promise of the coming Redeemer was stated in highly symbolic terms. God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head and you shall strike his heel. Obviously, this isn't simply history written in advance. It's a symbolic statement, very much of a piece with the evocative poetic language used throughout the Bible and especially in Revelation. The link Chilton makes between the literary style of Genesis and biblical prophecy, especially in Revelation, is very important. Terry drew a similar comparison a century earlier by saying, but if these opening chapters of the Bible are a revelation of God's creative relation to the world, May they not be apocalyptical in character? Is it not fitting that the canon of Scripture should be open as well as closed, should open as closed, rather, with an apocalypse? Now, what Terry is suggesting is that just as the last chapters in Revelation are apocalyptic in nature, so are the opening chapters in Genesis. You may never have thought of that. Now, this is my note here based on some things they said going on. It's worthy of note that the type of apocalyptic writing in Revelation and potentially the creation account of Genesis 
differs from the typical apocalyptic writings of the intertestament period between Malachi and Matthew, which was clearly thousands of years later than the writings in Genesis. Um, the primary difference is that the type of writing in Genesis and in Revelation, while symbolic and sometimes wild in character, conveys real events that took place within Israel's history. The reason I say that is because some apocalyptic apocalyptic literature is just sort of crazy and wild and isn't necessarily telling a true history of anything. And that's what's different about these Genesis and Revelation accounts. Let's go on. On page 271 of Beyond Creation Science, this example is given from Habakkuk's prayer. From uh, This is Habakkuk 3, 9 through 11. You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. Um, now, Beyond Creation Science notes that Habakkuk refers to real historical events in Israel's past. Right? He recounts the Exodus, the Red Sea crossing, conquest of Canaan example. But clearly this is done in a symbolic or apocalyptic manner. And they say you'll also see a lot of that in Psalm 18. Psalm 18, you know, God's breathing fire from his nostrils and all sorts of things, but it's retracing um, a real under, understanding from David's perspective of some of what God um, has done. Um, and they make this statement, Vaughn and Martin. Um, they say that, that they're first, um, there's a scientific description of the formation of the physical universe, and the second being a revelation of a curse that does not alter the physical creation. They're saying those are in congruous. How can we put those together? Let me go on. The creation account, like the fall recorded in Genesis 3, is primarily a covenantal statement. Therefore, it's prophetic rather than scientific. As James Montgomery Boyce writes, what do we find when we turn to the opening chapter of Genesis? Here the Christian view is stated for the first time and in definitive form. It is a theological statement, however, and must acknowledge this, because if we do not, we will inevitably find ourselves looking for a scientific explanation to be misled. So we're seeing this over and over and over. And this is where the this view, uh, where there is, I think, a, a connection relationally between this and the, the, the more functional view, that they're both saying whatever was happening physical, whatever Moses or whoever collected these writings or put it together, whatever they were meaning to communicate about the physical creation, there is so much more. And that's what I'm hoping you get from this, wherever you happen to land in these views or whether you're still in midair somewhere, uh, at least realize that whatever is going on with the physical creation, there is your gobs <laughs> more um, with, the, with the temple themes, with the covenantal themes and, and on all of this. And then all of a sudden Genesis just explodes in, in richness and, and glory and grandeur. And I want you to get that. Um, let's go on here. Um, this is from page 275 of Beyond Creation Science. An apocalyptic view of creation implies that the interpretive rules of the early chapters of Genesis are the same rules to follow when interpreting the prophets. And that makes sense. This has been argued for many years by a surprising number of Christian theologians. Most of these theologians, by the way, are not preterists. They don't believe in fulfillment. Um, but one that does, the famous preterist scholar Frederick Farrar, said this, and I wanted to get this quote because I thought it was good. He said, there is no other Eastern book in the world. I mean, listen to that claim. There is no other Eastern book in the world which we should have dreamed of understanding literally if it introduced speaking serpents and magic trees. Even the rabbis, stupidly literal, again, that's not my quote, it's his quote. But even the rabbis, stupidly literal, as were their frequent methods, were perfectly aware that the story of the fall was a philosophy, which is a vivid pictorial representation of the origin and growth of sin in the human heart. Now, uh, before uh, closing out this video, the authors realize some of the pushback, and even some of you listening might have the same thing, but wait just a minute. I mean, this is my note. Wait just a minute. Are you then saying that Genesis is just some sort of myth? I mean, should we just throw the whole thing out? It's just a bunch of symbols and pictures and a apocalyptic whatever poetry pictures why would i trust it okay fair question and they anticipate that pushback so recognizing this they go on to say the concern that a prophetic view of creation relegates the early chapters of genesis to anti-historical myth is unfounded 
Biblical prophecy, though symbolic and poetic in its literary style, always relates to historical events. Consider the prophecy given in Genesis 3.15 concerning the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. It is given in heavily symbolic poetic form, yet it came to pass ultimately with the crucifixion of Jesus in the first century. John even captures some of the imagery in Genesis by highlighting the location of the crucifixion, Golgotha, the place of the skull. The visual image is as historically graphic as Genesis 3.15 is symbolic. It's as if the very cross itself, planted on top of a hill, pierced the head of the serpent. So just because someone is something is communicated symbolically, or in this case, maybe, maybe even apocalyptically, in, in no way divorces that from historical events that it was portraying. In fact, sometimes it can, can make a, what actually happened much more powerful and significant. They continue, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> our covenant view of creation in conjunction with the covenant view of the end, remember they're trying to get consistency, incorporates and enhances the historical dimension of Genesis. The pattern is the apocalyptic examples we find elsewhere in scripture. Consider that portions of Matthew 24 and Revelation come to us in prophetic apocalyptic language, right? G uh, Jesus Riding, riding in the clouds, coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him. All that we see over and over in, in the Hebrew scriptures and the prophetic writings. Does this mean they are not historical? No. To the contrary, they do have reference to the contemporary historical experience of the early church and relate to first century events culminating in the final destruction of Judea and Jerusalem in AD 70. To say the biblical text is apocalyptic is to affirm that historical events underlie the symbolism. At the same time, the overriding concern so evident in Matthew 24 and Revelation is theological. They encourage covenantal faithfulness, perseverance, and obedience in the midst of trials and persecution. As such, they apply to all generations of God's people, no matter their particular historical context. God does not change so there's no reason to believe the principles of his covenant relationship to his people changes. A plain historical record is simply not the purpose of apocalyptic communication. And, and that basically summarizes that chapter. And then they go on to, to flesh out a lot of this much more specifically and practically. And of course, um, if you want to find out about that, you know, buy yourself a copy of Beyond Creation Science, buy a couple, or again, you can read it online. Uh, for free. They're also, and I'm not part of this, but I believe there's a Facebook group on Beyond Creation Science as well, if you want to learn more about this. So so let me just give you um, some closing thoughts here. Um, and I already kind of gave it earlier, but I just want to say it again. Wherever you land, or if you're still in midair on these different views of what exactly is happening in Genesis 1 through part of chapter 2 of the creation account, um, if if you're someone who has just seen it only as scientific and a material physical creation, the very least um, recognize there's so, so much more happening. You know, the more I learn about these things, just the more amazed I am by the scriptures and by the God who who superintended it or inspired these, you know, God breathed, they opened the stoves. Um, that's the, the Greek term there. These scriptures are breathed out um, by God. And it's, it's simply amazing and so much more rich when we'll, when we'll consider some things that may be a little bit different than what we've learned before. Some of you might wonder, uh, where do I land? That's honestly where I land right now, that, that whatever was being taught about the physical universe, because, you know, no one, no believer denies that, that, that God is involved in this, in this creation. And where I land is whatever was going on there, boy, there's a lot more. And I see the connections of the, the temples and the themes, I see the connections. Well, if Revelation isn't talking about the end of the world, but the end of the old covenant in that system, then shouldn't there be some things in Genesis that are talking about the heavens and earth in that sense? And, and I see that as well. And I'm just more amazed by, by the God who created all this. And then uh, last thing I would want to say, and I, I did this, um, I don't remember if it was the last video, maybe one before, but I held up a Bible and said, you know, it's just like these two or three pages that talk about whatever this creation was. And then at the very end of Revelation, whatever this new heavens and earth 
was, but the, the bulk of scripture is what's going on in between God redeeming a people for his glory, their good, and to a watching world. And I believe now as someone who holds to fulfillment, uh, we're in the new city. We're in the new Jerusalem. We're fully in the new covenant. We're new creations. That's one thing that baffled me for a long time. I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Um, the old is gone. Um, the new has come. Your new creations in Christ. And I thought, how in the world is it that we're new creations living in an old creation or an old world that makes zero goose egg sense at any rate i'm preaching now i'm moving ahead a little bit um but again the, the main thing we want to focus on is not so much you know what did god do scientifically at the beginning you know what's happening if we hold to that view you know, scientifically at the end the main point is what is god doing in between and again he's redeeming a people for his glory their good and for a watching world so we can invite people into this city so that they too can be in christ in the glorious new Jerusalem, how is life in the new city for you? Pastor Joel saying, bye for now.